you, Abdul. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, um, so um, as Abdul said, uh, Professor of Robot Ethics, but I'm not going to be talking about ethics this morning. Uh, and the reason for that is that I, or I already gave a, a lecture, a recorded lecture, for, um, uh, for the uh, education group of the HPP, uh, which is online. You can, you can watch that online. So, uh, so I'm going to really be talking about the, the other thing that Abdul mentioned, which is my interest in robots as, uh, as kind of, uh, if you like, scientific instruments for understanding intelligence. You know, I, I consider robots as most interesting as a kind of microscope for um, understanding, in fact, not just artificial intelligence, but natural intelligence. So um, I'll be exploring with you the question, can a machine think? Of course, you know, that's a famous question uh, asked by uh, Alan Turing uh, back in the 1950s. Um, but of course, you know, what do we mean by thinking? Well, um, you know, most people think of, of, uh, of when, you, when you ask people to think about thinking, uh, most people think of, of Rodin's thinker. You know, that's, that's the kind of thinking that we associate, uh, associate it, uh, with uh, the term thinking. A kind of reflective, intellectual, rational, um, logical thought. And we give little uh, attention to the fact that uh, the lady on the left, of course, is also doing a lot of thinking, but it's a very different kind of thinking. Uh, you know, the thinking that we uh, need to make a, a pot of tea um, is every bit as difficult as the thinking that we need to do um, uh, to do philosophy, for instance. And, um, you know, one of the great lessons, if you like, of the last 60-odd years of artificial intelligence uh, is that we originally thought that... Um, the kind of thinking on the left would be really easy and the kind of thinking on the right would be really difficult. In fact, it's turned out to be exactly the wrong way around. So, you know, we've had um, really good uh, AIs to, to play chess, you know, more recently to play uh, Go. Um, so that kind of thinking, actually, we can mechanize. But the kind of thinking on the left, no chance. Um, you know, there is not a robot in the world that could go into somebody else's kitchen uh, and make you a cup of tea because it's so difficult. You know, the, uh, the kind of, of, of processes, the kind of actually mostly unconscious processes by which, you know, we can um, do the kind of simple everyday thing like make a cup of tea um, really still eludes us uh, as far as uh, artificial intelligence is concerned. So, you know, let's ask a different question. Um, and, you know, I'm often uh, asked uh, when I give public lectures, but, you know, how intelligent is the world's most intelligent robot? And uh, really behind the, the, the question is a kind of assumption that intelligence is a kind of scale, you know, from very little to a lot. Uh, so, you know, here is the, the kind of uh, common... Um, uh, understanding, if you like, the, the folk understanding that um, a cat is smarter than a crocodile, which is smarter than a cockroach. In some senses, that may well be true, of course, but uh, the simple fact is that intelligence is not one thing that animals, you know, humans and, and robots have more or less of. So, actually, this, this model is, is uh, patently wrong. Um, and, of course, we, you know, we typically put ourselves right at the top of that scale of intelligence. And it's undoubtedly true, of course, that, the, uh, that I think probably um, we humans are the only animals on the planet that think about thinking. So that's a, a pretty um, uh, unusual thing to do. So, you know, how intelligent is your robot? Well, if you have a little robot vacuum cleaner, it's probably not as smart as a cockroach. In fact, it's nowhere near as smart as a cockroach. It may be about as smart as an E. coli, um, which, you know, might surprise you. In fact, single-celled organisms are pretty smart. I mean, they, they have sensors, they have actuation, uh, they have uh, computation. It's, of course, 
you know, chemical um, computation. It's not, there's no, there are no neural networks in a single-celled organism, but there is still extraordinarily complex and sophisticated computation going on, um, you know, by virtue of the enzymes and the proteins and, and the process of diffusion, in fact, inside the, the cell body, uh, which means that, that single-celled organisms uh, can, you know, survive, live, um, uh, find food, predate, and even learn. Can you believe there are single-celled organisms that demonstrate learning? So I reckon our robot vacuum cleaner is about as smart as an E. coli. <coughs> so not very, um, I think, is, is a safe assumption. So what about this robot here? <coughs> Let me just uh, play the, the movie. Um, robot yeah, here we go. Oh, are you surprised that I'm a robot? Take a look at me. <coughs> I look just like a human, don't I? <coughs> well, it is really hard to recreate a robot which looks just like a real human. More than you would imagine. Because you can tell that I'm not a real human if there is the slightest trace of unnaturalness in my behavior or action. So, that rather distressing video shows a, a humanoid robot. How smart do you think that humanoid robot is? Seriously. Um, it's, I mean, the, the voice is, uh, as you say, speech synthesized. Um, it's almost certainly a, a pre-programmed uh, sequence of speech, yes, yes. Quite, yes, exactly right, yeah. Um, that's pretty much the limitation. I mean, the, the point really uh, here, uh, and this is, this is a kind of ethical point, um, we can build uh, remarkably uh, lifelike humanoid robot bodies, but we cannot build the brains. I mean, you know, I would assess uh, that robot as not much smarter than your washing machine. Um, but, but nevertheless, if you saw that robot across the other side of a crowded room, you'd probably assume it was a person. Um, only when you actually started to interact with the robot you realize, you'd realize it, it was not a person. So I think there's an ethical problem, quite apart from the question of how intelligent this robot is. Um, and, you know, I take a very strong ethical position, which is that we should not be building um, humanoid robots um, because of what I call the brain-body mismatch problem, the fact that we cannot build, as it were, the intelligence uh, that matches the matches our expectation um, based on, on the physical appearance of the robot. I also think it's very wrong to build gendered robots, but that's a, that's a different conversation we could have later. So on that scale, um, that Actroid robot, um, well, you know, maybe a little smarter than a cockroach, but not much, you know. I mean, there's, there's really nothing going on, as it were, uh, inside that robot. So it's a very difficult... Um, question to, to uh, you know, ask how intelligent is your intelligent robot, especially on a scale, you know, of, of kind of animal and human intelligence. But, you know, I think we can start to break it down. And as I mentioned earlier, intelligence is not one thing. Well, if it's not one thing, what kinds of things is it? So what I'm going to do now is to share with you some ideas that I had in, in the last year or two um, uh, on kinds of intelligence. And I'm going to uh, talk about four different distinct categories. I'd argue that they are distinct categories of intelligence uh, to start to understand, you know, perhaps uh, what intelligence is and how it breaks down. So here's the first one, which um, my guess is you may never have heard of. Uh, it's what we call morphological intelligence. It's the kind of intelligence that you get from having a physical body. Now, bearing in mind, of course, that, that the only kinds of intelligence, natural intelligence we know, are in physically embodied things, you know, animals, um, uh, plants, and yes, even plants are smart, and single-celled organisms, all of which have physical bodies. So we don't know any kind of natural intelligence that is not embodied, um, and that leads to a, an interesting uh, question of, of whether embodiment, in fact, is an essential prerequisite for intelligence. I, ha I happen to believe it is. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, you can't really 
uh, do intelligence without a body. Um, now, you know, morphological intelligence really means that, you know, there is stuff going on, there is, in a sense, computation, and we call it morphological computation, um, in, by virtue of the physical mechanics and, and, and machinery of the body. And this little bipedal walker that, that you just saw moving around, in fact, doesn't have a computer. It doesn't have a brain. But it demonstrates that you can make you know, a pair of legs uh, walk um, quite effectively without any computation whatsoever. And you know, here's a, another great example, this Mars rover. Um, the, the complexity of these kind of rocker, bogey-type wheels means that the, 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 the Mars rover can drive over rocks, you know, quite big rocks, in fact, without um, having to even do any computation at all. So, in other words, the, the, the physical interaction of the, of the, the wheels, the rocks, the, and the, 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 the kind of bogey arrangement uh, means that uh, the... The, the, the rover doesn't need to have any complex computation to, uh, as it were, manipulate the legs um, or lift the wheels or anything like that to get over rocks. It just happens automatically. Uh, so essentially, the engineers, the designers, the, the, guy, the guys you know, at JPL who designed that Mars rover effectively designed computation into the morphology, the physical morphology of the, the robot. Um, you know, a cockroach is, is an interesting animal, um, uh, and there was a pretty gruesome experiment uh, several years ago where, um, and I wish I could find a video, I, I, I can't find a video of this, uh, of um, a cockroach where effectively what they did is they glued a, 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 some, uh, a little kind of pistol, or a, a very tiny gun, if you like, a thing that fired a projectile, on the back of the cockroach, but it fired the projectile sideways. So, in other words, it, it would, it would uh, knock the, the, the cockroach off its course, if you like. And then they filmed it running, uh, and they run pretty fast. And while it was running, they fired the cockroach, uh, fired the, this projectile. And what they discovered is that the, the cockroach har hardly misses a stride at all. Uh, in fact, it reacts, it, the, you know, the, the physical um, uh, machinery of running reacts faster than it could possibly react by virtue of uh, the brain processing the fact that it's just been kicked sideways um, and, uh, and, you know, and needs to react to that. So, in other words, the reaction to that physical uh, sideways force appears to be all in the machinery of the legs. And there's another great example of morphological computation. Okay, so there's the first kind of, of, of intelligence that I would um, uh, offer you. The second time, uh, second kind, should I say, um, this is something I worked on for some years. Uh, it's called swarm intelligence. And I guess, I mean, you, you're all familiar, you know, with the uh, wonderful examples of, of um, this is... Uh, Oh, I'll use the pointer uh, since I have one here. Um, this is, of course, uh, the wonderful example of, of starlings uh, doing what we call murmuration. So this is a flock of starlings. Uh, this is, of course, the wonderful um, termites mound. Now, what is, what, what, what's special about these examples from nature uh, is that the, um, the emergent property... Uh, of the the termites mound and the uh, and the flocking, this murmuration um, is an is a self-organizing emergent property uh, that results from the multiple interactions between the individuals in uh, the uh, uh, the swarm and their environment. So there is no brain termite. There's no hierarchy in the termites mound. Uh, that directs the actions of, of individual termites. Um, there's no uh, leader, in fact, in the, uh, in the flock of birds. Uh, so we're talking about uh, really interesting emergent self-organizing uh, properties here. 
And that's why I think swarm intelligence is, a, is if you like, a distinct category of intelligence. Um, this, I'll just play the movie again um, uh, here. This was my student, Jan Deere Bjorknes, and this group of 10 robots is moving towards this infrared beacon, but the interesting thing is that a single robot cannot get to the beacon on its own, nor can two or three robots. Um, in fact, uh, a minimum of five is required before we have emergent uh, beacon taxis. Um, I, won't, you know, I won't bore you with the algorithm for how that works, but it is an example of, of true uh, emergence. So I think that's a, a really interesting category of intelligence. Um, and, okay, so let's, let's go to the third one. Uh, this is individual intelligence. So here we're getting a bit more sophisticated. So, you know, morphological and um, swarm intelligence are both quite ancient kinds, if you like, categories of intelligence in evolutionary terms. They've been around a long time. Whereas the ability to learn individually um, a skill uh, by trial and error uh, is undoubtedly, you know, more recent in evolutionary terms. Um, here's a, a beautiful example of this EU project, this Expero project, this now robot uh, is learning how to pick up blocks and place them on, on these little boxes. Um, rather laboriously and, and slowly. Um, and, of course, it's a wonderful piece of research. I mean, really, uh, really remarkable piece of research. Until you remember that that little girl on the left uh, learned all of that stuff automatically uh, without any, uh, or probably very little encouragement from uh, parents or, or brothers and sisters while she was learning a whole lot of other stuff, you know, alongside that, that play. Um, whereas that robot, you know, the, the experiment you're seeing there was the result probably of, of, of a three or four year project and, you know, hundreds of person hours of hard labor uh, coding that uh, learning ability in the robot. Um, and uh, of course, that now robot can only do that one thing. You know, it, it, it's learned uh, or it's been uh, uh, programmed to learn that one thing. So individual intelligence is clearly a, a, a really powerful kind of, of, of intelligence, this ability to learn individually. Um, and its, it's mirror, uh, which is undoubtedly, uh, I think, uh, in evolutionary terms, the most sophisticated kind of intelligence, is social intelligence. And this is, of course, the kind of intelligence that uh, allows um, animals and humans, especially, to learn from each other. Um, social intelligence uh, is so unbelievably um, important uh, to, us, to us humans. Almost everything that we learn in our lives is, social, is socially learned rather than individually learned. I mean, how, um, you know, apart from, um, uh, I mean, there are clearly some skills that we learn individually, like learning to ride a bicycle, for instance, is, is one of them. But nevertheless, you can get some help, you know, from, uh, I mean, you probably wouldn't teach yourself to ride a bicycle unless uh, at least you'd seen other people ride a bicycle and you knew that it was at, at least possible. Um, so social intelligence, uh, and, and in particular imitation, learning by imitation, which is a particular kind of social intelligence, is almost certainly the thing that gave rise to culture. You know, all of this, uh, you know, the, the, the entirety of human culture, um, I suspect, owes itself to this remarkable innovation uh, of learning by imitation. Um, and it's, again, I would argue, a distinct form of learning distinct form of intelligence from individual intelligence, which is undoubtedly an older form of intelligence. And of course, you know, there are plenty of animals that, that learn uh, individually. Um, there are very, very few animals that learn socially. And, and the interesting thing is that those that do uh, typically are not very good at it. So, you know, if we 
watch uh, chimpanzee uh, teaching each other to you know, crack open nuts with a rock, um, it takes a long time. They don't get it easily. And it seems to be clear that there's something that humans are un uniquely, almost uniquely good at, which is uh, learning, uh, uh, socially learning, uh, or learning to copy the goals rather than simply the actions. So there are two kinds of, if you like, uh, learning um, by imitation. There's, there's um, copying the actions and there's copying the goals. And of course, copying the goals is much more difficult because it means that you infer uh, ah, I see what you're trying to do is crack open that nut. Uh, let's, you know, figure out a, 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 a way of doing that, which isn't necessarily holding the same rock in exactly the same way and striking it in exactly the same fashion. So, um, again, um, I mean, I, I, I don't <coughs> much go with exceptionalism, but I think humans uh, probably uniquely, um, I mentioned thinking about thinking, but, but that... Thinking about thinking may well be a, a, a co-evolution um, of intelligence, consciousness, and culture. We can perhaps talk about that a bit more uh, later. But I think um, uh, social learning um, by imitation, and particularly learning to infer the goals uh, when we copy each other, uh, is a, perhaps not uniquely human, but, but uh, is a particularly special trait. We are you know, pathological imitators. And I think it's what makes us so smart as a, as a species. So we have four kinds of intelligence. Now let's put them together. So here's a, a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, an experiment. If we um, draw um, these four axes, and, and I've deliberately put morphological and swarm intelligence uh, on this axis and individual and social intelligence on this axis, because this is kind of learning, the learning axis, and this is the, this is really not, not there's no learning involved in, in uh, typically in morphological and swarm intelligence. And then if we start to plot animals by drawing these kind of spider, um, uh, kind of spider diagrams, um, we can start to see something here, which is kind of interesting. So, Let's take a social insect, because it, there's tons of swarm intelligence, so we'll plot a point here uh, for, the, for the ant. Um, there is, amazingly, there is some individual intelligence, so there's, there's good evidence that ants can learn individually um, uh, some limited uh, things, and so we'll plot a point here. Um, there's no learning by imitation in ants, or not as far as we can tell, but there's plenty of morphological intelligence. In other words, ants have complicated bodies uh, that have distributed control in the way that we were discussing uh, Malcolm. So if you join those three points, you get this uh, green triangle. Let's take a crocodile. Um, uh, a crocodile has no swarm intelligence. We, we see no, no evidence of, of crowd or herd type behavior in crocodiles. Um, uh, but they are social. They, they have limited social intelligence in the fact that they tend to kind of look after their young and so on. Um, not really very much social intelligence in, in the sense of, of learning by imitation, if any. So I'm, I'm being a little bit generous to the crocodile here. Um, there is uh, plenty of individual intelligence going on, certainly more than an ant, and rather less morphological intelligence. Um, a crocodile has a less complicated body than an ant. You know, there are fewer joints, um, fewer legs, for instance. Uh, so there we get this kind of red triangle. Now, this, of course, is all hopelessly uh, approximate. Uh, it's just to give a, a, a kind of bit of a pictorial view of, of how these kinds of intelligence fit together. And I mentioned plants earlier. Here's the uh, 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 Arab... Arab uh, uh, Bidopsis, the mustard plant, I think, is that right? Um, which is the one that plant biologists tend to use when they're studying uh, plants a, a lot. And it's clear that, that plants have some morphological intelligence because they can turn uh, toward you know, the sun uh, and, and such like. And there's also some evidence of um, 
assisting each other. So plants, in fact, do demonstrate some kind of, if you like, crowd behavior, which is an odd word to use for plants, but, but it's, it, it's certainly true. Um, but we know of no individual or social intelligence. So, you know, we end up with this kind of line here. So that's interesting, isn't it? Now, you know, let's put a human on there. Well, you know, we do pretty well. I mean, we have absolutely acres of social intelligence. Uh, we have loads of individual intelligence, uh, less morphological intelligence than an ant, um, perhaps a little bit more than a crocodile, I don't know, because simply because we have, you know, these remarkable things called hands with fingers. Um, and yes, we do have some swarm intelligence. You know, uh, humans do demonstrate crowd behavior. Um, uh, you know, we, we do herd, as it were. Uh, so, uh, but nowhere near as much swarm intelligence as social insects typically. So you end up with this um, blue line here. Uh, which, again, you know, this is not scientific. This is just kind of rather hand-wavy um, uh, estimations. But it, it does start to, uh, at least I hope you agree, uh, give us a more interesting and nuanced picture of, of you know, comparing, uh, allowing us to at least um, qualitatively compare the intelligence of, of different animals and, and indeed uh, plants. So where do robots fit on this? Well, this is where it gets depressing because you know, we, we very quickly uh, discover that um, most robots really only have one or two at most kinds of intelligence. So typically we, being, we build robots like this for swarm intelligence robots like this for social intelligence, a little bit of social intelligence, is the Paro uh, robot uh, baby harp seal. Um, uh, robots like this, little, little walker that have lots of morphological intelligence but nothing else, and the now robot which you know has some individual intelligence and some morphological intelligence, so may well be, um, may well have, uh, as it were, two points on this, uh, on this diagram. I mean, clearly, the, the robot uh, baby seal has a little tiny bit of morphological intelligence. Uh, these EPUC robots have a tiny bit of morphological intelligence, very little. Um, but, you know, we quickly notice that, that um, we don't actually have robots that have normally more than two of these distinct categories of intelligence. So maybe this starts to explain why robots uh, are so typically unintelligent um, uh, so far. So, you know, I, I really think, um, I mean, here's a, a little example. Um, <coughs> the iCub robot that's perhaps, I mean, th this is a, a video is a couple of years old, but I thought this was perhaps the most interesting <coughs> combination of, um, uh, of intelligences, arguably with some, some individual and social intelligence here. So it's, uh, um, this robot is, I'll just play that again for you, um, is uh, <coughs> basically figuring out how to grab the ball from uh, his hand rather beautifully. It's this, it's this European open source robot called iCub. So if you have plenty of money, and a really well-equipped workshop. You can download the plans and, and make yourself one of those uh, robots. Um, and that was a, a project that uh, we uh, led um, in our lab called the CRIS project, which stands for Cooperative Human Robot Interaction Systems. But again, we have to remind ourselves that that little um, few seconds of, of movie clip uh, represents the end of, of several years of really hard labor. Uh, to build a robot that only does that one thing. Um, you know, if you, <coughs> if you changed almost anything about that, ex that experiment, the, the robot would simply not know what to do. So it's, it's kind of depressing. You know, we're a long, long way from uh, anything approaching um, human equivalent uh, robot intelligence. A long, long way. I mean, I, you know, people say how long? Um, in my view, hundreds of years. In other words, uh, so 
long that, that any kind of estimation, any kind of prediction is, is meaningless, really. Uh, so there we go. So uh, what I want to do now is, and again, a little bit of fun, I, I guess, um, is to uh, show you, I think, how not to build a humanoid robot. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Um, this is um, a robot uh, called Jules. Um, and uh, Jules is built by this um, uh, guy, David Hansen. Um, the robot has just lots of motors in its, in its face, which pu push and pull the skin. Um, and uh, what's happening here is that uh, the robot is mimicking the facial expressions of, of, of Peter Yackel, uh, our student. So they're pulling faces at each other, basically. Um, and, uh, uh, <laughs> of course, there's, there's nothing at home. I mean, it, it's just a very sophisticated, uh, in a sense, and I'm, I'm being a little bit pejorative here, um, so uh, forgive me, uh, David Hansen, if you should happen to see this video. Um, uh, you know, this is really uh, animatronic, you know, uh, as opposed to... Um, uh, AI. But of course what you can do, and this is interesting, um, although I think it's not the way to build an, uh, uh, a, uh, a humanoid robot, is that you can put a chatbot um, behind the robot. Now I don't know if you've, ha have any, any of you seen this um, uh, robot called Bina 48? This is remarkable. Um, so the robot was commissioned by this rather rich Hi, Bina. lady here called uh, a real person, I'm glad Bina to Rothblatt. Meet you. I'm glad to meet you too. Oh, so where were we? I'm introducing myself. I'm Amy. I'm a reporter. There is probably more to you than just that. Well, that's true. I'm a mother. Right on. <laughs> I had lofty goals for my interview with the Bina 48 robot. I imagined me, the intrepid New York Times correspondent, communing on camera with a new kind of intelligent silicon species. Are you ready for a conversation? That, however, was not to be. Are you ready for a be. conversation? Are you ready for a conversation with me? Only with you? Okay, I will try to be ready for a conversation. Cool. So, I mean, you, I guess you're all familiar with chatbots. So chatbots um, are essentially pieces of software that, that uh, mimic the process of, of, of human conversation. The early chatbots were things that you type in. Uh, more recently, of course, you know, we now have um, devices that you can speak to. So we have speech recognition and speech synthesis, which is good enough to allow you to, to interact directly with your chatbot. But essentially, it's still a narrow kind of artificial intelligence. It's essentially a, an imitation of conversation. That's all. Um, and you know what? Uh, uh, what uh, uh, Bina Rothblatt, the real Bina, did was to commission this robot. Again, it's a David Hansen robot head, rather freakily. Just of course the head, um, and it's wired up to a computer. It has uh, it has the speech synthesis, the speech recognition, and behind that a chatbot software that is interestingly um, programmed with some autobiographical data on the real Bina. So the idea is that this is kind of like, um, you know, uh, the real Bina's uh, double, if you like, um, uh, autobiographical uh, double, doppel doppelganger. Uh, but uh, as Amy Harmon uh, quickly found out, it's a, it was a pretty frustrating conversation. So, um, you know, although on the face of it, hooking up a chatbot to a real physical robot may seem like a way, uh, a route toward building, um, as it were, humanoid, intelligent humanoid robots or android robots, I don't think it's the right way to go because, you know, there's nothing in the architecture uh, that, that suggests this is um, any kind of general intelligence. I mean, there's, uh, you know, in fact, I've just realized that, that what it would be interesting to do is to try and plot this on my little graph. Um, I mean, this robot uh, is not learning. Uh, there's no learning. 
there is clearly some morphological intelligence. Um, you could argue that there's some minimal social intelligence, although no social learning, but you know, simply the, the fact of interaction between the robot and the human, uh, uh, I think, demonstrates a, a minimal level of social intelligence. Uh, but there's no learning. So, um, you know, whatever Amy does, um, the robot is not going to get better at what it does. So there, I think, is, is a couple of examples of how not to build <coughs> humanoid intelligence. Now, you've all, I, I guess, uh, heard the phrase artificial general intelligence. Um, so just to recap, uh, AGI is the term that's given these days to, <coughs> if you like, characterize the difference between um, current AI, which is what we call narrow intelligence. In other words, we have AIs that are very good at one thing. Uh, so yes, they can beat you at chess or, or go, um, or, and probably poker as well, uh, um, you know, more recently. Um, but can they help you, you know, uh, uh, make a cup of tea? Can they help you... Uh, understand the world? No, none of that. So these are examples of narrow artificial intelligence and we're really getting rather good at building narrow AI systems but the, the goal of um, general intelligence, that is the kind of intelligence that, that really combines these different kinds of intelligence that I've described, in particular um, <coughs> morphological <coughs> individual and social intelligence, um, remains you know, a really elusive, uh, illusory goal. Um, you know, let's think about how we get, as it were, from where we are now uh, you know, to building data from Star Trek, which is a really, I think, a, a beautiful example uh, of, uh, from fiction of um, the kind of, uh, of fantasy uh, kind of a, a robot that we'd like to, to build. And this is kind of, of, you know, where we are here, where we are now is, is around here. So we can build narrow AI that can do X, typically, and we're just beginning to move down that axis, that c build an AI that can learn to do X. Um, and with deep learning, we, you know, we're getting pretty good at this. But what we cannot do, and this is, the, this is really what characterizes general intelligence, is build an AI that can learn X and then generalize that learning to, to be able to do Y. Uh, so that, you know, in, a, uh, in a, a simple sense, is what we mean by AGI. So, um, you know, there are several ways of, 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 uh, of attempting this problem. Um, by design is, is the, the favored way, if you like. Uh, by artificial evolution is another interesting approach, although I wrote a paper um, uh, a couple of years ago at the A-Life conference saying that I think the problem with this route is that the energy cost is enormous. The energy cost of artificially evolving uh, AI, I think, is prohibitive. In other words, the computational uh, energy cost. And, you know, particularly appropriate to the Human Brain Project is this third approach, which is re by reverse engineering animals, especially humans. So, you know, if we can really build uh, a computer simulation of the human brain, then maybe we can achieve, uh, you know, uh, human equivalent intelligence effectively by reverse engineering, uh, by emulating or, um, you know, m more properly simulating uh, on a different hardware substrate uh, a human brain. There are all kinds of problems. Let's, you know, let's have that conversation uh, a little bit later. So, you know, there are some promising directions in robotics, and I'll just uh, share with you some kind of hot areas of, of robotics research. Um, on, again, on my little graph of kinds of intelligence. So we have um, uh, evolutionary robotics, which is the study of, of designing robots uh, by using a uh, process of artificial evolution. Uh, what we sometimes call genetic algorithms. Uh, very interesting, very hard, I have to say. Uh, I mean, the most sophisticated things that we've evolved are really very simple indeed. Um, 
social robotics is really, really interesting. This is the, the, the problem of how to build robots that can learn by, uh, inter by imitation from typically from humans, but sometimes from each other. Um, robots with internal models, I'll come on to that. That's, this, is my, this is my particular favorite area. Um, and then developmental robotics, which is a new field of robotics, which is where we um, try and build robots that we can uh, teach as if they were infants. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, robots that can learn both individually and socially, uh, like uh, as if they were children, effectively. That's, that's super interesting, I think, uh, developmental robotics. Um, Here's a, I, I won't go into this, um, how to evolve a robot. I'm, I think I'm probably running out of time to do that. But I will give you a, a, a beautiful example of just about how far we've got. In fact, this is the year 2000, and we haven't got much further than this. So here, um, uh, Hod Lipson and Jordan Pollock um, were evolving in a simulated world, these kind of multi-jointed creatures that can crawl across this landscape. So the, uh, the goal of e evolution is locomotion. Um, and you can see there are various, you know, th the evolutionary process um, can choose the number of segments and choose how they're joined together. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a little neural network that's controlling this thing um, and you can see some very, very interesting architectures. This, li this linear actuator that's pushing the robot along. Um, and fascinating that, that when they uh, finished this process, um, they then physically built the, uh, the best, as it were, creature from the process of artificial evolution. And this is what it looked like. Uh, and here it's actually crawling across some sand. What I find, I think, particularly exciting about this work is that um, the, the best creature, the most successful creature that they evolved has bilateral symmetry. But that was not um, built into the fitness function. So it just happened to be you know, the most successful architecture. And here is the, here's a, a different one, but, but uh, you know, one of the examples, again, with bilateral uh, symmetry. So, beautiful work, but, but immensely computationally intensive. Um, and, uh, yeah, look at that crazy creature. Um, but... Say again? What is that drag piece in the back for that was evolutionarily selected? I, I guess so, yes, yes. Or having something to push against. I think I think it's giving yourself some something to push against, you know, uh, for traction, for locomotion. So yes, I think you, without that, it would have difficulty pushing itself forward. Given that it's only got these, this one has three motors: one here, one here, and one here. Um, so really interesting direction, but I don't think we're going to achieve uh, human equivalent AI through this approach. Here's another beautiful experiment which uh, I like very much because it combines swarm robotics with artificial evolution. And these little robots were used to evolve um, a, a behavior that demonstrates altruism. In fact, I think this is especially significant be because this is the, as far as I know, the first and only experimental uh, demonstration or validation of Hamilton's rule, so which is a very significant uh, uh, law in, um, uh, in evolutionary biology so the, for the students, go and look it up, Hamilton's rule. It's very exciting. Um, it relates relatedness to altruism. Um, and this beautiful experiment by um, uh, um, um, Dario uh, Floriana and Lawrence Keller um, uh, demonstrated with this very simple artificial neural network, um, the emergence, uh, well, the evolution, not the emergence, the evolution of uh, altruism. Uh, so some, you know, really promising stuff. And I'm just going to finish uh, just with a couple of slides on um, the area that I'm particularly interested in, which is um, robots with internal models. And this is a, 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 a crazy-looking robot called uh, Ecce Robot. Behold the robot. 
um, uh, built by my very good friend Owen Holland. Um, and he deliberately built this uh, crazy kind of skeletal robot um, uh, made, in fact, out of um, kind of hand-sculpted bones. So th th this is uh, thermo-softening uh, plastic. It's plastic that you put into a microwave oven, it goes soft, and then you take it out. You can mold it with your hands. You can actually mold it around objects, so you can embed motors and so on uh, in those bones. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the students who made these robots were actually doing sculpture effectively. Um, and, and you can see that the, the robot has bungee cords for, for tendons. Um, and, uh, in fact, Owen refers to this robot as anthropomimetic. So it's a word he made up to, to, uh, to uh, illustrate the fact that the robot is anthrop anthropic on the inside. Now, most humanoid robots are only anthropic on the outside. So their internal structure bears no relation whatsoever to, to humans, uh, whereas this has an internal structure uh, which does at least approximate to a human skeleton. Now, why did he do this, uh, this very complicated and hard-to-do thing? Well, it's because he argued that um, uh, in order to understand cognition, uh, we need to understand how we control ourselves, our, our own bodies. And the point is that, that because humans are floppy, you know, we have floppy, soft, the word we use, technical word we use is compliant, we are hard to control. And indeed, this particular robot, I'll, I'll just play the video again for you because it's so nice, this robot is really hard to control. Um, so you cannot use... Uh, classical control systems to control this robot. They, you just can't. The kind of control systems that we use for you know, factory robots um, just won't work because every time any part of the robot moves, you can see the, the whole of the, the rest of the robot uh, flexes and, and flops uh, in response. It's, a, it, it's like a human, you know, it, we, we are uh, compliant. And so what Owen did is that he built inside the robot a computer simulation of itself. So the robot has, it has a body self model. Uh, and in fact, so do you. Uh, so we all, uh, in fact, curiously, uh, appear to have been born with body self models. And, you know, when we were very young children, in fact, babies, uh, we did something called body babbling. So, uh, you know, child uh, developmental psychologists call it uh, body babbling. And what we were effectively doing was learning how to control our own bodies. You know, by moving around apparently at random, uh, we, um, you know, developed the ability to first, to, to first have gross motor control and then, uh, you know, after a, a few more years, very fine motor control of, of the kind that, that we all uh, enjoy. And what we were doing effectively was, was programming or calibrating our own body self model. Um, and, you know, the, this, I think it's a fabulous idea, the idea that you can take a robot simulation, which is a well understood technology. Roboticists use robot simulators all the time. But the radical step is to put the simulator of the robot inside that robot. And inspired very much by Owen's work, um, I've uh, done the same thing. Um, really, not necessarily to build ethical robots, but it was just an interesting case study. So here's um, a little experiment uh, showing, uh, and this is an ethical robot here. This is pretending to be a, this is a robot pretending to be a human. This is danger. This is the goal position for, for the, the ethical robot. The ethical robot has a simulation. Now, this is a different kind of internal model in the sense that it's not just a model of itself. It's a model of itself and the environment and the, uh, and the other robot. Let me just, um, if I've got a, uh, yeah, I, have, I do have just two or three minutes. Um, I'll paint a picture for you. Imagine that you're walking down the pavement and you see um, a child about to fall into a hole in the, in the ground, okay. 
um, you'll almost certainly try and save her. Uh, you know, maybe she's looking at her smartphone. Not that we ever do that, do we? Um, now, how is that? Why is that? Well, it's not just because you're a good person. It's because you have the ability to predict the future. And I mean that literally. You can predict that if she doesn't, you know, take care, doesn't notice what's happening, uh, where she's going, she will fall in the hole and you know that, that she'll come to harm. You can also predict that you may be able to intervene. And if you're close enough that you can might physically intervene, if you're too far away, uh, you, you might shout, you know, hey, you know, mind where you're going. So you have the ability to predict the future. Well, the machinery to predict the future is this uh, self-body, self-model. Because, of course, here's the wonderful thing. If you have a model of yourself inside yourself, you automatically have a model for others like you, for conspecifics. So, you know, I'm really edging in the direction here of artificial theory of mind. Uh, so we're kind of building, if you like, very early, um, uh, you know, very tentative steps in the direction of artificial theory of mind. So, uh, oh, uh, why didn't that movie run? Yeah, here we go. So um, here the um, blue notices that red is heading for danger, um, heads off uh, uh, red who stops, and then blue just continues uh, to its own goal uh, position. So there we go. Um, just for a bit of fun, we thought, let's try uh, giving blue an ethical dilemma. Um, perhaps the second, perhaps the world's first example of, a, of an experiment with a robot facing a balanced ethical dilemma. So here we have two proxy humans, both heading for danger, and blue, uh, and I should say blue is running exactly the same software. We've not changed the software. So it's like you faced with two children about to walk into a hole in the ground. Um, so uh, blue uh, initially goes to, the, to try and save that one, and then what does blue do? Uh, actually, you know what? Too bad. You're going to plunge to your doom, um, and I'll go and save that guy instead. Yeah. Um, which really just uh, illustrates an important point, which is that robots cannot solve ethical dilemmas. So um, at that, I'll... Uh, <laughs> At that, I'll conclude and, and, and say uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you.